Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Zach Brown, and I am joined today uh, by, uh, I'll, here, I'll let everyone introduce themselves. I'm Beth Massey. I'm the product marketing manager for the .NET platform at Microsoft. And I'm Dave Tillman. I'm the tech lead on SteelToe. And I just do uh, marketing and product strategy stuff at Pivotal. Uh, but today, we are going to talk to you about SteelToe. And we're going to talk, uh, uh, Beth is going to start it off by talking about the .NET renaissance and what is happening uh, right now in the .NET community and what's been happening over the last several years and what makes this very moment a really, really exciting time to be a .NET developer. Uh, then I'll talk to you a little bit about Steel Toe from a high level, uh, business uh, value, uh, why, what is Steel Toe, and more importantly, why is Steel Toe? Why did we build it? And, um, and then I'll talk a little bit about what's inside the box, what's in Steel Toe. Then I'll hand it off to Dave, and Dave will walk us through a demo and a deep dive on some of the Steel Toe features, some very, very cool things that you'll get to see today. If you really wanted to see uh, an open code window with some C-sharp code, you won't be disappointed. And then we'll wrap it up with uh, some resources if you want to learn more, if you want to get deeper into Steel Toe, get your hands wet, your hands dirty themselves, um, and uh, a, a little bit about our roadmap, where we're going next and what the next few features will be. Before we get started, I want to encourage everyone that's in the room here, there's quite a few folks, uh, to be engaged. This is, uh, we want this conversation to be a dialogue that continues well beyond the scope of this individual session. Here you've got some, some Twitter handles. Please tweet to us. Uh, please feel free to take photos during the session. Uh, let's keep the conversation going. All right. Well, on that note, I'm going to hand things over to Beth. Thanks, Zach. <laughs> OK, guys, um, let's get started. Clicker. Is it working? It's the right and left buttons. God. OK. Oh, here we go. <laughs> All right, so first off, I wanted to start off with uh, just a little history lesson. And I wanted to say happy birthday to .NET. It's the 15th birthday of when .NET was actually released um, this year. So uh, .NET was released in February of 2002. And um, if you guys have been paying attention at all to any of the .NET blogs or anything like that, we actually earlier this year did a whole set of really cool interviews with a lot of you know uh, thinkers in the .NET community. And so it's been a really fun year, um, and uh, we've come a long way. Uh, but if you've been here uh, since the beginning, I think we started releasing alphas like 17 years ago. So it's it's been a really fun ride. Um, well, I think we all are very familiar with what we released 15 years ago, and that was the .NET framework. Um, so it was the um, implementation of the ECMA 335 uh, common language infrastructure that Microsoft built for building Windows applications. So the implementation of .NET that Microsoft built was for building uh, web and desktop applications on Windows. Over the years, though, there have been many more implementations based on that spec. Mono is actually an open source implementation of .NET. Um, and in fact, Microsoft built a, a, an implementation called Rotor that was more of an educational um, version of, of the implementation of that spec. Um, and then about in November 2014, we released what was the open source .NET Core which is another implementation of .NET. So now we have three major implementations of .NET. And over the years, some of these things have fragmented. You know, these implementations were very specific for different types of workloads. And some of the things that happened was some fragmentation in the APIs, naturally, because they were being maintained by different people and different companies. Um, in 2016, my, Microsoft acquired Xamarin, okay, which the founder, Miguel, Miguel, Miguel de Casa, created Mono. And we brought Mono into what's called the .NET Foundation, which is our open source software foundation for building the .NET ecosystem. So because of that, um, we are able to create a much more standardized library. Um, it's a spec called the .NET standard that all the implementations must adhere to um, and follow. And so what that means is that as a .NET developer, when you uh, write against a .NET standard, you can write libraries that are portable across all the implementations. And not only is it just your code, but the binaries themselves, OK? So this is what we're working on today and where our investments lie um, with the community and open source community and 
Microsoft and many partners that are part of the .NET Foundation, including Google and Samsung and Red Hat, um, we're working on standardizing uh, the, that base class libraries. You'll also notice that we have a common infrastructure, which includes our languages. So we have C Sharp, F Sharp, Visual Basic, and there's many, many more languages that the community have implemented. Um, those languages are also common to this platform. Not only is the platform, you know, uh, uh, unified, but we have a set of tools that allow you to build .NET applications for any operating system on any operating system. So it's not just about Visual Studio on Windows anymore. If you're happy on a Mac, we have Visual Studio for Mac, and we have Visual Studio Code, which works on any, uh, any device, or Windows, Linux, and Mac. Um, we even have a, a command line interface that you can use at the command line that even Visual Studio and all our tools use too. So there's not any magic happening anymore like there used to be um, in the tooling itself. So you can choose your platform um, on what you're comfortable in developing with. And so that's really about .NET. It's really about .NET everywhere. So if you learn C Sharp, we hope that you can use your skills across any thing you want to build. If we look at it like workloads, those implementations I mentioned specialize in different types of applications that you build. .NET Core specializes in cloud-native cross-platform services. Um, Mono and Xamarin specializes in um, iOS and Android um, and Windows mobile applications. So this is kind of looks at it by the workload. So that .NET standard, it really is providing that specification for any platform to implement. And that means that when you write APIs, when you write your libraries, you can use a set of APIs, and we have a ton of them now in .NET Standard 2. Um, we have actually uh, 20,000 more than .NET Standard 1X, or about 32,000 APIs now that are across all of these implementations. Um, and that covers about 70% of the NuGet packages that are up on NuGet. Um, the 30% that are left are actually uh, specific to, say, UI frameworks and stuff. So that's what's really cool. You can take a library that was written and maybe abandoned by its auth original author that was written for .NET Framework 2, and you can use it in your .NET Core applications. Okay, that's what it means. All right, that binary compatibility. There's a lot of innovation also going on uh, around up and down the stack, but I'd like to talk a little bit about our languages. Um, and just to make it clear that we have multiple languages on the .NET platform. C Sharp is our premier language. Uh, it's you know, our object-oriented language that uh, is, should be very familiar with Java developers, okay? the syntax is sort of a C-style syntax. And the strategy is to really innovate aggressively except, and responsibly. So not to break your applications that you wrote you know, 10 years ago, but to make sure that we innovate okay, in that language space. So you're gonna start to see, and you actually probably already did start to see, we started dot releases this year, right? So instead of, we used to have like C sharp two, three, four, five, six, seven. Well, then we started seven, one, seven, two. We're starting to release features quicker in smaller sets so that we can get them out to you quicker, okay? And we do this all in the open on GitHub. We have GitHub um, slash dot net is like our org for a foundation and uh, C Sharp Lang, and there's a VB Lang out there, and you can contribute to the design specs out there with the language designers. Um, F Sharp is really our functional language, and we want it to be the most productive functional language on the .NET platform. So you'll see a lot of new tooling and supported uh, templates and style of uh, apps that you can build with F Sharp going forward. Um, and I just wanted to mention Span of T was just recently implemented um, in up and down our stack. And this really brings uh, performance improvements um, to, to you without even you having to use this new language construct. Um, it, we used it inside of the APIs ourselves, so that basically it provides safe access to uh, continu continuous chunks of memory. So like an array, except way faster and not having to use unsafe code. Okay, so we're really starting to see a lot of innovation happening up and down the stack. And it's not just Microsoft contributing to these things, it's, it's everyone and, uh, and the community and um, many of our partners, like Pivotal. So um, this is sort of a, a map of, this is a map of actually of all of the pull requests that we've had this year as just kind of like how many people are giving you a sense of the size of, of, of the contributions that we're having to our .NET repos. Um, 
This is how we've seen the trajectory of our community accepted pull requests since going open source. Obviously, that has brought in a flood of innovation into the, um, into the stack. Uh, you'll see a couple of quotes here from um, our partners, Samsung, for instance. Um, they're betting their, their next release of Tizen.4 on .NET. You'll be able to write uh, .NET apps for uh, their televisions and watches and washing machines and over 50 million devices worldwide. So Samsung's working on that. Um, they're actually one of the biggest contributors to, um, to .NET Core. Uh, you'll see a game studio here that is really uh, really in, important for them is performance of ASP.NET with these microservices that they were building. And so they actually contributed a ton of the performance improvements that you see in Kestrel today, which is pretty cool. And then I mentioned over you know, 25,000 community contributions from people outside of Microsoft. So that's really, that's really where we're seeing this, sort of this momentum. And that's kind of what's starting this renaissance, right? This is about not just Microsoft, owning and, and shepherding .NET along. It's about the whole entire community and these explosion of ideas and this explosion of just, you know, um, um, excitement around contributing to the, the projects. Um, we were named earlier by the Cloud Native Computing Foundation uh, as one of the top 30 highest velocity OSS projects out there, so that's really cool to see. So you'll see on uh, the axis here, this is just the, the pull requests and issues coming in and the commits. So .NET is actually the highest uh, developer framework actually up there, so that's pretty cool. So I mentioned performance improvements, and this is really like an area that uh, the community has submitted many of these improvements um, to our base class libraries, for instance. Um, there's a lot of just um, APIs out there that are more niche APIs and aren't used by like the most of the world, and we're kind of deprioritized on the .NET Teams list of things to do, but you'll see that the community members found it very important for their particular, um, their particular you know, applications to use these, and so they submit these Things. And we all benefit from those sorts of things. So it's really awesome to see. Um, we've also done a ton of just um, uh, performance work um, in our just-in-time compiler, as well as just some um, the profile guided optimization for uh, generating better code, optimized code in our um, native components. And there's just some really interesting um, case studies that we're starting to see from customers starting to use this uh, .NET Core stack. And, and this one is actually a pretty, um, a pretty cool startup, Raygun, that uh, used .NET Core and just replaced some services that they had originally built in Node.js and just saw their performance improvements, incredible improvements. So we're, here is a chart uh, that basically shows the performance improvements of ASP.NET Core. Um, this is the Tech Empower benchmarks, round 13. Round 14 is the same, it's just the, a little bit different on the numbers here. Um, but you can take a look at, the, these are the plain text tests. You see that ASP.NET Core on Linux is actually faster than the Java servlet, so that's, uh, woo! Don't tell anybody else at the conference, I guess. I might get kicked out. I'll be escorted out onto the street. Um, so that's actually really, we work really hard as a team and as a community and as in our open source projects to maintain this performance. Um, and, and that's really cool to see. So this part of this renaissance is also about the, the momentum that we see. We, I mean, for, for, I don't know, 10 plus years, I think .NET jobs have always been number two to Java jobs out there, okay? That hasn't really changed at all, but it's not declining, okay? That's the relevance here is the same as it was, uh, you know, when .NET released. But what's really cool is to see sort of this modern relevance I like to see. We look, we take a look at um, uh, places like Hacker News and Reddit, and we really are starting to see this growth in just popularity of people talking about .NET more. Um, and so you'll kind of start to see the chart kind of moves up right as we start to open source and go cross-platform. So we're finding that there's just more conversations happening about like Java or about .NET just like Java, which is cool. Also, it was really nice to see that .NET is very loved, and uh, this developer survey came out earlier this year before .NET Core 2 released, which .NET Core 2 released in August. So we were actually number three on the most loved you know, framework, and that was really, really cool to see even without our 2.0 release. Um, so it's just gotten better. I'm hoping if they do it again, it's gonna hit number one. Um, and then you'll see that C-sharp is still a, a most popular language among uh, web and desktop developers. So that's also a, a really nice number to keep up there. Um, so .NET is definitely loved. 
So uh, you guys are all here, and there's a lot of people in the room, and so I, I assume that you love .NET as well. So other people agree with all of you. So you guys are smart. Um, some other things that I, you know, that are kind of um, what's sort of happening here in the community and in the ecosystem as part of sort of this like, you know, explosion of ideas, especially as we went cross-platform, is to start embracing different like patterns for architecture. So like we have a ton of architecture guides. Um, the one that's probably most relevant to you guys in the room here is the microservices and Docker. Um, and partners like Pivotal and Steeltoe are really filling a gap in the .NET ecosystem, like how Spring like fills the gap for microservices in the Java ecosystem. Steeltoe will fill these, these gaps for, for .NET developers. So we're really starting to see more and more of these patterns emerging inside of uh, the .NET ecosystem as well. And so that's really exciting to see. So if you just head to our website, you know, .net, dot, dot .net slash architecture, there's a ton of guides, ebooks, samples on how to build all kinds of stuff. And so here's just a smattering of, of some of the sample of, uh, of customers that we've had uh, recently uh, use .NET Core and some of their testimonials here. So you can take a look at them on our website as well, slash customers. Um, GoDaddy was probably the most recent that we just published. Um, so they're seeing like huge performance improvements as well, moving to .NET Core um, and C Sharp. Um, Tencent actually is a really interesting one. That one is, uh, like that backs the service of WeChat Pay in China. So they have, um, I don't know, half a billion transactions per day running through .NET Core services right now. So that one was really interesting as well. And you know, just fun ones like Astro Reality, Quantum Technologies is just a startup. They're using Unity on, um, their, on their mobile phone and they have models, like real models of the moon and you use your phone and it does an augmented reality and pulls out all this data from Cosmos DB using .NET Core and like gives you all this information that like an astronomy nerd would love to see on the surface of the moon. So at any rate, there's some really interesting things happening. So all up and down the stack from the cloud all the way down to the devices using .NET. So all of this ecosystem is really like what the .NET Foundation tries to shepherd and, and pull a center of gravity around. There are over 60 projects now inside of the .NET Foundation. The .NET Foundation was created in, in beginning early 2014, and one of the first projects to enter the foundation was our compiler platform, Roslyn. Um, so since then, we've had a ton of companies join the foundation as technical steering group members. I mentioned Red Hat, Google, Samsung, Unity, JetBrains, they're all part in the, of the technical steering group that pushes the, the platform and innovates on the platform and makes sure that, you know, that the platform is uh, gonna be around for another 15 years. Okay. Um, recently, uh, we, we, uh, a few, few more projects joined. We have .NET Nuke now, SourceLink, NUnit, Iron Python, and I'm really um, happy to reannounce that Steeltoe just joined the foundation two weeks ago. Um, thank you, Zach. Thank you, Dave. Um, it's a really, really awesome to have you here. Um, and like I mentioned, this really does feel a gap that the .NET community, I think, really needs uh, when in building microservices. So thank you so much. So. Zach, I'll hand it over to you. Okay, thank you. Wow, some exciting stuff. Uh, some, some very cool themes and events that we, we heard about from Beth, um, like a pivot towards uh, open source and the open source community, uh, embracing cross-platform and really giving developers some different choices. Um, and so th this is really a, a great place where Steel Toe seems to, to fit in and, uh, as Beth put it, uh, fill a need in the .NET community. So we're really excited about that. Um, all right, well, next I, I want to talk a little bit about what Steel Toe is. So we had a great little uh, history lesson and then a state of the, state of the .NET um, as far as where we are today. So let's look at what Steel Toe gives you today. Um, right before I got up on stage, uh, some folks in the audience mentioned how far Steel Toe has come over the last year. And uh, this is not a, a historical perspective. This shows you what we have today. But there, there is a lot. And it's, a, it's been a very fast moving uh, project. Uh, so before I talk about what's in Steel Toe, as I mentioned, I'll talk about uh, why is Steel Toe and uh, why did we build it? What problems are we trying to solve? Uh, so the first reason is to address cloud-native.net, uh, and specifically to help you build 
uh, .NET applications, ASP.NET applications that run really well on Cloud Foundry, that run as well on Cloud Foundry as any uh, Spring Boot or, or Spring Cloud application. That's, that was really job one. But there's a little bit of a challenge. Uh, I like to say this quote, uh, today's, uh, today's best practices are tomorrow's anti-patterns. And there's a corollary to that, which is yesterday's best practices have become today's anti-patterns. There were lots of things that we did uh, in the past that made a lot of sense at the time, but if you use those same application practices today, then you might have problems if you're trying to scale your app or if you're trying to build something that's, that's highly resilient. Uh, some of those things are um, building, uh, leveraging in-process session state. It was easy, it was convenient, we all did it, uh, but it can be problematic. Or building a tight coupling to the server where your application is running. Things like the Windows registry or the global assembly cache, making assumptions about those impl that implicit state, or, uh, or writing state to the local file system. Uh, th those sorts of practices uh, can be problematic in today's hyperscale cloud world. So first and foremost, the goal of Steeltoe was to give you developers a set of tools to build cloud native applications and make them run really well on Cloud Foundry. Okay, so that's reason number one. What's reason number two? Microservices. You can hardly go to a conference nowadays without them mentioning microservices, so I didn't want to disappoint. Um, there are lots of benefits of microservices architectures, and a lot of them have to do with the sort of process and team and organizational benefits. Uh, you can get tremendous team velocity because you've got discrete testing cycles and release cycles. You can build and release things independently of one another. Uh, code bases are much smaller than the big monolith, so if you're bringing a new developer on board to the team, they don't have to learn that entire monolithic code base before they can be productive. They can be productive right away. That's great. Uh, you've also got the ability to choose the right tool for the right job, choose the right language and the right tool set uh, when you're implementing each, uh, each service. Uh, you might have something, uh, a service that requires, uh, that has some dependencies uh, on, uh, that require it to be written in .NET Framework and run on Windows, for example. Uh, there, there's probably lots of those. And then maybe there's some other component that you want to write uh, that'll work in .NET Core and run on Linux. That's great. And maybe there's some other components in your application that are written in Node or Java. And so making all those pieces and, and, uh, in the right tool for the right job and the right team and then having them be able to talk to each other. Uh, so th these are some of the great benefits. And then ultimately, if you want to scale those components, you get to scale them independently. You're getting a lot of traffic on the, on the web UI. You can scale that up horizontally, and you don't necessarily have to scale out all the backend components if they don't need it at the time. There's a challenge, though. There's always a but. Microservices are hard. Microservices are effectively distributed systems, and distributed systems bring with them a certain complexity. So if you are uh, trying to troubleshoot your monolith, and you're trying to identify where there's a bug, chances are the bug is inside your monolith. If you're trying to find a bug in an um, application comprised of a bunch of different microservices, it can be kind of like a murder mystery, determining exactly where the problem is. Um, how about global configuration? In a monolith, it's pretty easy to set some global config and read it from anywhere. It's hard if it's a bunch of microservices, especially if they're implemented in different languages and frameworks. How do you make that work? Um, how about if you want to look up the dynamic addresses of services that you depend on when they're running at horizontal scale on some sort of a self-healing cloud platform, adding and subtracting instances in real time, well, the IP addresses might be constantly changing. So how do you, how do you reach out and call one of those services? And how do you do that behind a firewall when you can't rely on DNS? Um, how about um, if one of the services that you depend on stops responding completely? and uh, your application needs to behave gracefully and not totally break. Well, so these are, these are some of the challenges, but the good, news, the good news is there were some great people that came before us that solved a lot of these problems. So the Netflix team are legendary for building all sorts of uh, microservices infrastructure for their massive online video streaming platform, and then the cool thing was they made it available to the masses. They open sourced their projects. Um, 
But there was a problem. It was all very tightly coupled to AWS, and it wasn't necessarily easy to consume. So the Spring folks, the Spring community, came in and made all that available uh, to anyone anywhere who was using Java, which is if you're a Java developer. But it doesn't do a whole lot for .NET developers. So that's why Steeltoe comes in and brings these patterns to .NET developers. So ultimately, this is why we built Steeltoe, to help you build cloud-native .NET applications that run really well on Cloud Foundry and that leverage Spring Cloud tooling for resilient microservices. All right, so this is the why. Let's look a little bit about at what's inside the box. Cloud-native .NET. So, um, this is kind of organized in two separate sections. The first are some of those cloud-native tools that I, that I mentioned. Um, if you are deploying an application onto Cloud Foundry, then you likely have some backing services and backend services. And uh, Steeltoe simplifies the process of automatically detecting, discovering, and uh, connecting to those backing services. Uh, here, here are some examples that are available out of the box today. MySQL, Postgres, Redis, RabbitMQ, OAuth, and then uh, SQL Server is, uh, is going to come in a release candidate. We'll have a release candidate out later this month. Um, so the, the cool thing about the way that connectors are built is that you're able to override the configuration on your local machine while you're doing uh, local development. And then when you push to the cloud, it automatically picks up the right uh, connectors. All right, so then, then the next part of it is security providers. So Steeltoe provides some specific security-related services that simplify uh, connecting to OAuth and uh, Pivotal SSO. Pivotal has a single sign-on uh, service inside of Cloud Foundry. There is also, if you want to access resources like API endpoints that require uh, JSON Web Token, then you're able to do that. Uh, one example is in Cloud Foundry, there's the, the Cloud Controller API. Uh, but uh, that's a, a very common uh, security pattern now in the cloud. And then, there, and then there's one more thing. It's this Redis-backed keyring repository. So the Steeltoe extends the ASP.NET Core data protection library. So by default, if you use this data protection library, it persists keys to the local file system. But if you're running your application at horizontal scale, that's obviously problematic. So in this implementation, Steeltoe uh, introduces a Cloud Foundry-based Redis instance uh, to store those keys. Uh, going forward, um, so if you're running your applications uh, in production, uh, troubleshooting them uh, you know, can be a challenge, microservices especially. So here are a set of tools that you can use to troubleshoot your microservices when they're running on Cloud Foundry uh, and running anywhere in, in production. Um, so there are a set of endpoints that were inspired by the Spring Boot Actuator project uh, that ornament your uh, running microservice and provide you some information. So your application's running, you need to troubleshoot it, what's the first thing you need to look at? Well, you probably need to correspond that running application to a specific git commit, a specific commit and source control. Well, there's an endpoint for that. Maybe you want to look at the individual health status of the dependent components. Maybe there's a database or another uh, service that it depends on. There's an endpoint for that. If you want to look at the last 100 uh, requests, HTTP requests that came in and the responses that went out, well, there's an endpoint for that as well. And then the most powerful one, my personal favorite, is an endpoint called loggers. This allows you, and we'll demonstrate this later, Dave will demonstrate this, this allows you to in real time, change the logging level of individual components of your application. So imagine if you've got a shopping cart and it seems to be misbehaving and you want to dial it up so that you've got tremendously verbose debug logging pouring out into your logs, but not affect the end user experience of anybody who's in the middle of checking out with their shopping cart, well, that, that's totally possible and we'll see that today. All right, so then uh, there is, uh, it, in ASP.NET, there's a configuration provider construct, and Steeltoe provides two custom configuration providers. So out of the box uh, with ASP.NET, you can read in uh, file sources of configuration data. Uh, you know, it supports XML files, uh, INI files. Uh, you can bring in environment variables. There are a variety of sources that you can pull config from. 
Uh, we've extended what's in, uh, what comes out of the box with two uh, custom configuration providers. So the first is called Cloud Foundry. It automatically reads in the Cloud Foundry environment variables that are available inside your application's container. So this is where you get important information about things like the services that are bound to your application. And uh, automatically, Cloud Foundry reads those into the, to the configuration dictionary that you get inside your application. Uh, then, in addition, we provide a config server provider. So this allows you to access configuration data that's stored in a Spring Cloud config server instance. And that can be backed by Git, a Git repo, or, or Vault, et cetera. And let me talk a little bit more closely about Spring Cloud config server. So ultimately, the 12 factors dictate that you should separate your code from your configuration. OK, that's great. But they doesn't answer the question where you should put your configuration. That's the hard part. Right, so, um, so, so where do you store it? In, in uh, Spring Cloud Config Server, you have a central place to store all the configuration for your application, and you can store it in a Git repo, for example, and then everything is, uh, is controlled and you have a full audit log of all the changes that have been made. Um, and as I mentioned, it's also possible to store it in HashiCorp Vault in case you wanted to store something that was a little more sensitive in there as well. Uh, so the, the basic way that, the, that this works is you push your application's configuration into that config repo, and then when your app comes up, it calls out to that config server and pulls the latest config from that, from that repo. And the config server is constantly um, staying in sync with what's in the Git repo. It's got its own cache uh, in case that link breaks for some reason, and then it uses the hash to make sure that it's giving you the most up-to-date information. So then the best part of config server is that it's, it's possible to implement an endpoint on your application so that you can cause it to refresh without having to stop and restart your application. So you can update the config of your running app. All right, so next we'll talk a little bit about resilient microservices and the constructs that Steeltoe provides uh, for resilient microservices. So the, the first of these is service discovery. Uh, service discovery, as you probably are aware, it allows you to late bind to services that you depend on, bind at runtime to these backing services. And uh, the way that Steeltoe works with uh, service discovery is it implements a client for Netflix Eureka that is available to you as a .NET developer building a .NET application. And so when your application comes online, it's got, uh, it knows that it needs to register with this Eureka server. It registers and, and advertises itself as a service provider. And then when service consumers come online, they reach out and they pull the latest list of healthy instances from the Eureka server. So Eureka uh, keeps uh, a heartbeat going so it knows which instances of that scaled out application are running and which ones are healthy, and therefore you always get a, a list of the, the healthy instances. Um, then on the client side, you, it just uh, does sort of random load balancing across all the different instances. All right, and the next piece that we've got is Circuit Breaker. Steeltoe includes a full .NET implementation of the Netflix Hystrix Circuit Breaker. It allows your app to fail gracefully when a dependent microservice becomes unavailable and your users never have to see some sort of a nasty error message. Uh, Hystrix also includes a full set of rich metrics as well as a dashboard to visualize the status of all your circuits across your application. Uh, here's a little overview of how uh, Circuit Breaker works. As long as the dependent service remains healthy, the Circuit Breaker remains closed, and all calls that are going to it are passed directly through. But when some sort of a failure threshold is reached, then that circuit breaker opens. And any call that comes in falls back to a default fallback behavior or data set that you can specify. And that gives the, the uh, dependent service time to recover so that you're not constantly bombarding it with new requests and uh, making it difficult for it to self-heal. Every so often, the circuit breaker passes through a request in order to determine the status of that backend service. If that backend service becomes healthy, then it closes the circuit breaker and uh, it, open, it opens up communication to go through it. 
All right, so, so these, are, these are some of the, these are the constructs that are inside of steel toe. These are the libraries that are inside of steel toe. And uh, I am, uh, I'm happy that I, I'm, okay, well, with one other slide here. So just to wrap things up, steel toe is open and flexible. Uh, you, it works with both .NET Core and .NET Framework. It works on Windows, it works on Linux. It works standalone running on your development machine. It works with your, whether your application is deployed to Cloud Foundry. And it's now part of the .NET Foundation. Uh, so on that note, I'm going to hand things over to, to Dave, Dave Tillman. Uh, he's the lead engineer on Steel Toe. He's been here since the very beginning. And uh, he's going to show you some of Steel Toe working. All right. Which way, this one? Yeah. All right. So. Um, <clears throat> Lucky me, I do draw, uh, drew the uh, demo straw. I have to do the demo part of this. Uh, I think Zach uh, stacked it against me. So let's, um, <laughs> let's hope the demo gods are looking out for us today, and uh, let's see if we can get through this without too much pain. Um, everything was working a minute ago, trust me, okay? So. <laughs> okay, so uh, here's what we've got. So uh, out in, uh, I think, uh, that out, out in uh, the uh, Steel Toe OSS GitHub area, we've got uh, a samples uh, directory or samples uh, repo that has uh, all kinds of samples in it. And one of them that's out there is the, something we call the Music Store. And um, uh, the Music Store uh, originated from Microsoft. It is, if you go to ASP.net and look in Microsoft's reference, or look at Microsoft's uh, code, code base for AS, ASP.NET Core, you'll find a music store out there. And so what we did is we took that music store and we kind of massaged it a little bit and tried to break it up into some microservices. And uh, this is what we ended up with. We ended up with uh, uh, three back-end microservices, uh, a music store that is able to offer up music and let you browse and look at albums by genre, et cetera, et cetera. In fact, I'm, I'm guessing a lot of you, or those of you .NET developers, have seen this app before. It's been around for, for quite a while. Microsoft has, has made it available quite, for quite some time. Uh, so we broke out the music store piece uh, separately. And we tied it to a MySQL database. Uh, we did a shopping cart, and we did order processing. And then we front-ended it with uh, a music UI component, OK? And so what I'm going to demo today is basically this application where we've broken it all up, and then what we did was we used Steel Toe to make it all work together again, right? So you break it up into microservices, now you need to apply things like uh, uh, discovery so that you can discover backend services. You need to have a place that you can centrally store the configuration now for all of these components, right? So that they all, you can centrally manage and, and ad administer the configuration. So I'm gonna go through all those components and the things that we used uh, to build out this now once, once we broke it up and needed to put it back together. So um, uh, let me think what else I needed to say. I think that was it. So let me just break through, let me go through the, uh, through all the pieces. So the first thing we did was we had to add the config server into the mix. And so there's a steel toe client, as, as Zach mentioned, that allows us to access the configuration server from any one of those four components. Um, and we are now, once we have that in place within our application, we're able to um, centrally manage the configuration for all those components. And I'll show you this here in a, in a, in a few minutes, how easy that was. Uh, the next thing that uh, we did was we had, notice we have some backend services there. Uh, MySQL, uh, for example, is used to uh, hold the shopping cart, the orders, et cetera, et cetera. And we also had another service that we plugged in, which is Redis. And let me explain a little bit. So you, obviously MySQL connection is, is clear what that's all about, right? We're storing uh, the various type, types of information in, in each one of those. But the Redis connection is a little different, a little interesting, is that, remember, we want this thing to be horizontally scalable, right? So in other words, we want to be able to spin up instances of all those things up and down as needed. Well, the Music Store app, uh, the Music Store UI portion uses Session. And by default in ANC 2.0 or ANC period, uh, session defaults to an in-memory ca in uh, uh, cache to hold uh, session state, right? So obviously we needed a different, we needed more of a centralized place to put, to hold session. So we used the Redis connector uh, in Steel Toe to uh, go ahead and bind to a Redis cache to store session. The other important thing, Zach mentioned this, is we, we also used 
uh, we, we take care of the problem with uh, data protection keys. Um, the keys for data protection by default are stored on a local file system. And so when each one of the music store UI instances would start up, it would create its own set of keys in this disk space, disk that's going to go away should that music store UI app crash. And so we would con constantly, constantly lose uh, our, our keys. So what we do is actually the, Microsoft already provides as part of ANC. They already provide a way to store the, the key ring up in Redis. So all we really did was we wired up or made it easy so that uh, if you bind a Redis cache to your music store UI and push it up into Cloud Foundry, it's running in Cloud Foundry, we wire up that connection so that it, it uh, seamlessly works. And I'll, we'll show you some of that in code here in a bit. OK. Um, Moving forward, uh, okay, so we broke it all apart. Now we need to piece it all back together with service discovery. In other words, the music UI needs some way of figuring out how to communicate with the store when we need to browse music, right, and issue the rest calls that uh, exist in the, in the music store. So uh, what we do is we add the Eureka server via Spring Cloud Services on Cloud Foundry. We add the Eureka server into the mix. We make all those components tie into the Eureka server or have access to it so that the music store, the shopping cart, and the order processing component can register with the Eureka server, its service, and the music UI can look up and get uh, the addresses or the endpoints for, uh, for those services. Next, we, um, we want to make this, this uh, app manageable from the uh, uh, Cloud Foundry app manager. So as Zach mentioned, so this is some of the new stuff we recently added. We uh, added into it very simply the health endpoints, the trace endpoints, the logger stuff, all that, just like Zach explained. It's very simple to add into your, uh, your uh, .NET application and uh, make it now manageable and more visible within Pivotal Cloud Foundry. And so we'll, we'll demo that here first in a second. And then. Uh, the last thing we did is um, we wanted to build in a little bit of fault tolerant capability to it, right? So what happens if the uh, music store, for example, goes down and becomes unavailable? We'd like for that UI, uh, music UI to still be responsive and still be functional, right? And so we're going to show you uh, how we implemented or made use of Netflix Hystrix uh, to uh, basically wrap requests that we're issuing to that back-end music store, and uh, we'll show how the music UI, we'll, we'll crash the music store, and we'll show how the music UI continues to function. Okay? So let's first just start out with the music store, and we'll click around in it to make sure everybody's comfortable and under, understands what it does. So um, the music store is real simple. Um, it, you know, it's an e-commerce type, type application. Uh, if you click home, you get uh, basically a drop, you can get access to a drop down that shows you all the genres that are in the store. Notice we have 15 genres that we can pick from. Uh, we can drill into a specific genre and look at the albums in that genre, and then we can actually dig down into the particular uh, uh, album and get some more information, not a whole lot, but a little bit. At least we find out the cost. Notice we can add it to the cart do that kind of stuff. We can go through checkout, processing, and all that stuff. So you, get, you generally get the idea, right? Very simple app, really, um, but uh, quite handy to uh, demo how, net, how uh, Steel Toe works. So we've got uh, uh, the store with the, when we hit the home button, we get basically the genres that, that exist. And this is important because I'm going to show you some, some details here in a minute. And then down below, another thing that we get is the um, top selling albums, that, that list down here at the very bottom. That's the, the set of top, top selling al albums. OK, so now I'm going to switch over to the app manager and do a Marco Rubio. and. Um, Bring up, uh, bring up the Apps Manager. So most, hopefully a lot of you already know the uh, Apps Manager. It gives you a view of the running application. Uh, it's uh, organized by an org and a space. We've got, in this case, the four components pushed into Cloud Foundry. Um, we're running this in the music space. <clears throat> and um, the first thing I want to look at is I want to take a look at um, the management endpoints and kind of show you what they look like and how, how they're visible uh, within uh, your uh, application. So let's, uh, let's pick uh, the music store. We'll drill into that. 
Um, first of all, a couple things. If the endpoints are enabled in your application, the first thing you would see is you, you would see this little, uh, unfortunately called Spring Boot. Uh, I think this is a Spring Boot uh, symbol, if I'm not mistaken, isn't it? Uh, the good news is in an upcoming, very up, new and upcoming release, we get our own symbol for uh, .NET steel toe based application. So you'll see a different symbol here soon uh, in an upcoming release. Um, and then what happens is if the, if the application's been enabled with these endpoints, these management endpoints, you end up getting some additional uh, 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 things that you can do basically at, in, in this mode. And the first thing that, that you should see is this little either up or down arrow or, or symbol that represents the health of the application. And when you select that, you basically get this uh, information back that is the status, the health check status of the application itself. And this is more detailed information that you get as a result of than just uh, looking at the memory or the CPU usage or whatever. This actually comes out of the application itself, right? And out of the box, we provide a couple health, and, and the way this works is simply there is a eye health uh, aggregator that uh, gets put into the service container, uh, ASP.NET service container, and uh, that aggregator then looks at eye health contributors that exist in the container as well. And then it will call each one of those contributors for it to pr produce its health. And so you as a developer, we provide some out of the box, and I'm showing you uh, one that shows the disk space usage for that particular app, and then there's a MySQL health contributor at the very bottom, okay? And uh, you can write your own. You can write your own custom health, uh, health, uh, provide health uh, providers, basically, health information providers. And um, uh, it's very simple to do. It's very easy to do. And in fact, I'll, I'll show you one here in a little bit if I have time. So, um, so the and then the health aggregator aggregates up the health report from every, every piece. You can write your own custom health aggregator to, to uh, process the uh, health the way you want. And then it gets reported back down to the, uh, and it just comes down as JSON. If you click this, you actually see the, the JSON that's actually being reported back from the, uh, by, by, from the .NET application, okay? So that's one of, that's, uh, that's one of the things you get with the, health, with the uh, management endpoints. Um, Zach mentioned uh, the info endpoint. So again, notice the, uh, the Spring Boot, uh, we'll get our own, uh, then the Spring Boot one. Um, Here's the, that information Zach mentioned that has the, the git commit in, in information. Uh, you, what you have to do is you have to add something into your C, uh, csproj file that will actually generate the git information out on file, and then that gets included in the uh, publish and push of the, of the application. That information then is just read and brought back down to the, uh, down to the apps manager here. Um, Zach mentioned trace. Here is a... Uh, Here's a list of the trace. Notice uh, we've been hitting the website. Notice there are a couple endpoints there, top selling and genres. Um, if we, uh, for example, if we go back here, do that, go back to the apps manager and refresh, uh, we see we've just updated with some new. If you drill into one of these, you see um, right here, you see basically the request and response. You see how much time it took. This particular request took 16 milliseconds, uh, and you see all the headers and that sort of stuff. This is also very configurable. In other words, what's included in this trace information, you can configure uh, as well, no problem. Uh, notice that we're showing all instances. So if we had multiple instances, this is, this is a view that's showing uh, trace information from every instance, uh, in this case, the music store. You can drill down into a single instance and just look at that if, if that's important to you. And then uh, this one, uh, which is my favorite, and Zach's favorite too, as I remember, uh, this one is um, where you get to configure the logging levels for your, for your application. So we can click on that little button, and uh, first thing you notice is that <clears throat> up here in the right corner is the number of actual uh, uh, created loggers that are running in that particular application right now. So there are 95 loggers. Um, we can then begin typing in here and say, uh, say go to music, whoops, music. And uh, notice we got, the, we got things like the store controller, which you'd kind of expect. So we can go and just click on this little uh, tab over here and turn on debug logging for that specific controller. 
close this and um, I'll tail the logs here right here and we'll go look at we'll go hit just hit the website a couple times and go back here and now we look down in here and it's kind of hard to see but here's some debug logging right here uh, get top selling it's all it prints out that's all it logs it's not that fancy but and notice we have get genre down here as well okay and the, probably the thing that's most important it's coming out as at, at debug level uh, as well okay and then of course we can go back and say uh, music and you know put it back the way it was because we're done fighting whatever fire we've captured the information that we needed in order to solve the the problem become the hero of the day right so that's the idea so okay so that's um that's endpoints um let me uh let me show code here's some code that shows you how simple it is this is uh this is the music store this is the startup class can you all see that or do i need to uh let me see if I make that a little bigger. Uh, this is the um, startup for the music store itself, the one we were just looking at. And um, in order to add the endpoints, the management endpoints, you add the endpoints into the service container. Um, add Cloud Foundry actuators is the call. You pass in a configuration just in case you want to customize it with some, some stuff. And then uh, you have to add. Um, the actuators, they're called actuators, into the uh, pipeline as well. So you do use Cloud Foundry actuators. Uh, you would, of course, if you wanted to, write your own custom. So here's a, here's a health contributor right here. This is the uh, MySQL health contributor. It uh, implements a particular interface. There's a single method you have to implement called health. And it's that simple, really. And uh, you write the code. Now, we have, like I said, we have some out of the box that you can, you can make use of, so. OK? All right, let me look at my list to make sure I don't forget anything. We've talked about logging. Uh, let's move on to connectors. So let's take a look at services. So I'm in the I'm in, back in the apps manager. I'm looking at the list of services that have been service instances that have been created in this space or in this uh, uh, yeah in this space, and um, shows uh, you know the service uh, type and their name and how many apps are bound to it. And we see, for example, all the MySQL instances. Each one of the backend uh, microservices have their own copy or I'm sorry their own instance of a MySQL database. Uh, and then notice we've got Redis up above, right? I mentioned Redis is being used. Notice there's only one app that's bound to it. That's the Music Store UI. And then, of course, down below here, we've got the Circuit Breaker dashboard, or the hist I like to refer to it more as a Hystrix dashboard, the uh, service registry, and the config server. Uh, let's, uh, let's just first quickly drill into the config server. Here we see the bound apps. They're all listed there because, that we, again, we're centrally managing our configuration. So we want all of the apps to come up and pull from the same location. And uh, in fact, there's manage buttons within uh, Spring Cloud Services that gives you access to some of the Spring Cloud Services uh, stuff. So let me hopefully I remember my password. Oh, good. So uh, you know, here's a. Uh, not much here other than it tells us the config server is up and online. We've got uh, here the GitHub repo that we're pulling from. Um, here's what the GitHub repo looks like, just if you're curious. Uh, it's basically got, notice that it's got YAML files in it, one for each one of the components of the application. And then there's this one called application.yaml. That's where you can put every, anything that's common to all components into that one, uh, that one uh, YAML file. So when each one of the components starts up, it calls the config server, the config server brings down, based on the application, the right configuration data and gives it to it for startup. That simple. Um, let's look at service discovery. So bring up service discovery. Notice that all four of the apps are, are bound to that service within Cloud Foundry. Let's go ahead and click the Manage button. Uh, so in this, in this case, the, the uh, Steel Toe component is, is uh, uh, Eureka client that's 
being used to communicate with the Eureka server to do both looks, lookups and registrations of services. Um, <clears throat> let's see, we've got, notice we've got three apps that are registered today, uh, luckily, because that's what we need to run this thing. Um, we've, and then if you click on this little, uh, little button here, you see what instances of that app or that service are actually active at that point in time. So let's, uh, let's do something fun. Let's go back here, go to order processing, and let's, uh, let's just, let's add another order processing. What the heck, we got, we're all here together. Let's see how well it comes up. So then we go back over here, and uh, notice that this has gone from one to two, and uh, you know here we are, we've got two order processing. So what happens is, dynamically, you can scale up and down your application. As they come up and go down, they get registered uh, into the service registry, and then the client is constantly, periodically pulling the service registry down, the steel toe client, per periodically pulling the service registry down and making it available. So it will see, momentarily, it will see uh, this new update of, of uh, service information. Likewise, if something crashes and goes away, it eventually gets evicted out of the service registry and things are, things are good. Keep in mind that this, th this stuff that I'm talking about applies to Java apps, it applies to any type. This is a polyglot kind of environment, right? So we're, not, we're showing you .NET. What we've done with the Steel Toe project is we've enabled you as .NET developers to make use of this infrastructure within your apps on Cloud Foundry. And we're trying to make it as simple and as easy as possible. We're trying to make .NET to be a first class citizen on Pivotal Cloud Foundry. We want you to build these workloads on, on Cloud Foundry. And that's what Steel Toe's all about. I kind of sounded like a marketing guy at that point, didn't uh -oh. I? Uh -oh. Okay, uh, let's see, what else we need to do? Oh, I know, let's look at, um, let's look at uh, Hystrix. All right, so there's only one app bound to the Hystrix dashboard. Uh, let me, let me, it's a music store UI, and I'll explain why, so we'll, Let's bring that up. Um, yeah, you can see that pretty good. All right, so what are we looking at? So um, before I dive into what you're seeing on this, on this screen, I probably should explain a little bit. Zach kind of talked about it a little bit, but what Hystrix all, is all about. So Hyst Hystrix came from uh, Netflix. This is not something that uh, the Spring Team or Pivotal invented from scratch. It's something that uh, came from uh, Netflix. And um, uh, it was put in place because of what Zach said. In building highly distributed microservices-based architectures, uh, bad things happen, things fail, things get slow, things get you know, not good. And uh, in order to keep applications up and running, uh, Netflix, uh, and responsive, Netflix knew, Netflix understood that they needed to provide some sort of framework to their developers to deal with faults, latency, and that sort of stuff. So they put together a framework called Hystrix. And uh, it is a Java framework originally. And uh, what we did in the Steel Toe project is we uh, uh, took that technology and we made a .NET implementation of that so that you can make use of the same uh, infrastructure, the same framework on uh, in a .NET application. And the beauty of this is, is that if you're a multi, uh, you know, a polyglot kind of, kind of organization where you've got Java and .NET, uh, and you want to now have a single dashboard that's showing you visibility into uh, the Hystrix information, which I'll talk about here in a second, um, you've now got a single dashboard that allows you to have this polyglot environment that's able to, uh, to show you visibility into uh, what's happening in your system. And so what this framework does that, that Netflix did, uh, implemented, was it does two things. One is it gives the programmer a programming model or a structure uh, upon which to deal with faults in latency, okay? So uh, before this kind of thing was put in place, every programmer would write their own or have to deal with it in their own way, and their structure would not be, uh, would not be uh, all that great, right? So this provides a nice framework, a structure for which their programmers can, and can deal with faults and latency, et cetera, in their, in, their, uh, in their application. The second thing that it does is then, and so the way it works real simply is, is that you have these things called Hystrix commands. You create a class that acts as a wrapper to that external dependency, right? And you inherit from that framework that, uh, that uh, is called Hystrix. 
you inherit from that, you gain a bunch of things. You inherit some good stuff. You inherit, for example, a circuit breaker pattern, if you want to use it, that you can enable. You enable a you, you inherit a thread pool, for example, that you can then run all your external requests on. Uh, and you can, you can control and manage that thread pool. So there, it, you basically inherit a bunch of great patterns for dealing with fault tolerance, for, for basically implementing fault tolerance in your application, okay? And then with that, when you inherit from that framework, you also get metrics. You get performance information. So you get, you get failure information, right? So when things start going bad, when you're making requests against those external services, things go, start to go bad, you get real-time, near real-time information that things are going bad, okay? And that's the other thing you get. So what, what we have here is, in this diagram, we've got four uh, kind of boxes here, and notice the names of them. One is called get top, top albums, get album, get genres, and get genre. And um, each one of those represents an external request that the music UI is making against the music store, okay? <clears throat> We've seen that already, right, as I browse, to, browse the application. And so let's do some fun stuff here. Let's Bring that over there, or no, let's not do that. Let's do, Looks like we're down to our last few minutes, so okay, I gotta go quick, I gotta go quick. Gosh, darn. Okay, um, so let me show you something. Um, all right, so when people are clicking on the website, notice the, notice the uh, Hystrix dashboard. So, when the Hystrix dashboard is, is going along, we, we're getting top albums, we're seeing requests per second showing up over here. We're getting um, get genres because we're pulling in all these genres, okay? And then if we drill into a particular album, we'll see some activity on the album side of things. So it's showing performance data for each one of those activities that we're hitting on the, on the uh, music store. So let's, let's do something fun. Let's uh, go over here and let's just kill the music store. And you know, we want the store to continue to be responsive. So now we no longer have a music store behind us. But you know what, one of the things we did is we implemented, so I'm clicking away. Imagine I'm a, a big user here. You know, I'm a million users clicking on this website. And um, notice that get genres, we're starting to see some red. That's not good, red is bad, we see some red. Notice, uh, notice we're seeing 100% failure. So what happened is, for a while, the user was seeing basically um, uh, cached information, basically. The commands that are used to make these requests are um, uh, commands that uh, are, are uh, caching the, the information as it comes back in. So for a while, the music store UI is just working against a bunch of cached albums and genres and so forth inside. Notice also, if I drill down and go into, am I running out of time, Zach? Yeah, we're over. Down to the last couple minutes. Okay, I'm going to quit here. But so then, let's do something really cool. So you saw the fact that it was um, that it was still uh, everything was still up and running. So you know, let's let's do the right thing. Let's start up the music store again. And uh, notice that the circuits also broke open. So at some point, based on the number of requests I was doing and how fast I was clicking. By the way, I'm just clicking on the home thing here. And uh, notice that all those circuits closed again, started to close, and all the red has gone away. So our UI stayed functional, it stayed running. We actually were running with a scaled down version of the music data so the user could actually check out, buy an album. They just weren't seeing the entire music store, they were seeing a confined version of that. And they, by, doing, by putting it behind the Hystrix commands, you're able to basically shield uh, the UI from, from all that activity. All right, thrilling, almost as thrilling as seeing the space shuttle dock to the International Space Station, huh? Um, okay, uh, so just a, a couple words on the Steel Toe Roadmap. Where are we? Where are we going? What's coming next? We've got a release candidate that's slated for release uh, this month, in December. It's going to include, it, we'll call it 2.0, so this will be 2.0 RC1. And this will include, finally, full ASP.NET Core 2.0 compatibility. Uh, it'll include cred, uh, support for CredHub. This is a credential vault uh, that's part of the Cloud Foundry ecosystem. And uh, we're also debuting a connector for uh, Microsoft SQL Server, so that's exciting. 
Uh, and then beyond 2.0, what's coming, we've got uh, plans for some additional management endpoints, specifically the ability to pull down a thread dump or a heap dump if your application stops behaving, uh, as well as distributed tracing capabilities uh, leveraging Zipkin, and also a Netflix ribbon, which is a project that allows you to have a pluggable client-side load balancer if you're using uh, Eureka. Uh, some resources here on getting started with Steel Toe. If you want to learn more, come to our website, uh, take a look at our Git repo, our NuGet feed, uh, and definitely join us in Slack. Uh, that's where the, uh, the public community conversation happens, and anyone is welcome to join that Slack channel. Uh, and then I'd like to provide a couple other resources for here at the conference. Uh, here we are at a Java conference, but if you are interested in .NET Windows, there are a couple other talks that are .NET Windows related. Uh, there's a talk later today at 4.20 uh, by Capgemini on migrating .NET and .NET Core applications to PCF. Uh, there's a talk by uh, Charles Schwab on uh, modernizing and migrating to the cloud. Uh, they're a big .NET Windows shop, so that one looks interesting as well. That's later today at 5 o'clock. And then ensuring platform security with Windows using Bosch add-ons and runtime config. Uh, this is a talk by Boeing uh, on operating uh, Windows as an operating system, a server operating system as part of Cloud Foundry. And I want to add one more that's not on my list. Uh, Chris Sterling, who uh, happens to be sitting in the audience, is speaking uh, just, just after this, right, or 340? Uh, on Spring Cloud Services. So we, we spoke about Spring Cloud Services uh, throughout the talk, uh, Eureka, um, Hystrix, et cetera. Uh, so if you, if you want to go deeper into that stuff, then definitely come and see uh, Chris's talk. Um, all right. Uh, oh, I also want to call out the Pivotal Demo Lounge at the Pivotal booth. We've got some workstations set up. They're the Dell monitors. Uh, they've got, uh, you can get your hands dirty and try things out, push apps to Cloud Foundry yourself. And then the last call to action that I have is Cloud Foundry Summit is coming up in April of next year in Boston. And they've introduced this time for the first time ever a cloud native .NET track. So if you're using .NET today on Cloud Foundry, please submit a paper. Uh, the, the one caveat is the deadline's coming up really quick. It's this Friday the 8th. But if, you're, if, if you've got some, uh, some ingenuity, if you've got a plane ride home, then, uh, then you can probably get one in in time. So, so please submit to uh, Cloud Foundry Summit. And there's the URL if you want to do so. Um, all right, so uh, I, I think that's basically it. Thanks, everybody, for, for coming. We appreciate your time today.